Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to Podcastage. This is my review of the brand new interface from Focusrite, the 2i2 4th Gen. If you are interested in this interface, it costs about $200. Like always, I'll throw some links in the description down below. Full disclosure, I bought this with my own money. All of my recording settings will be listed in the doobly-doo as well as the description. And now let's talk about what comes in the box. What a surprise, you are going to get the audio interface, an approximately 3 foot or 1 meter USB-C to USB-A cable, a little bit of documentation, and if you register this with Focusrite, you get a bunch of software as well. Then as far as the build quality, this interface feels pretty darn good. It has an all aluminum chassis with plastic on the front and the rear. The inputs and the outputs all feel very nice with minimal wobble. The dials are all nicely attached and they feel great to turn. They also have minimal wobble. And in case it matters to you, this interface is made in Malaysia. On the top of the interface, you have the Focusrite logo. On the bottom, you have a bunch of information as well as four rubber feet. On the back, you have two XLR inputs, a set of balanced quarter inch outputs to run to your studio monitors, a USB-C port to connect this to your computer or device, a USB-C port to power the interface in case your device doesn't offer sufficient power, and a Kensington lock port. On the front, you have two quarter inch line level or instrument level inputs. You have two encoder dials to set the gain for those quarter inch or the XLR inputs. Surrounding those dials, you have meters, which will show you what your gain is set at. And they also function as a much more useful meter compared to the prior generation's halo lights. You have a select button to choose which input you're adjusting, a 48 volts phantom power button to turn on phantom power for both inputs simultaneously, an instrument input selection button, an auto gain button to automatically set your gain, a clip safe mode button, an air circuit button which allows you to turn on a presence boost or a presence boost plus drive mode, an output dial which controls the studio monitor outputs on the rear, a direct monitor button which turns on on mono or stereo monitoring of your inputs, a headphone volume control, and a quarter inch headphone output. Then as far as the specs, this offers 24-bit up to 192 kilohertz conversion. The preamps have an EIN of minus 127 dBUA. They offer a gain range of 69 decibels, noise, 48 volts of phantom power, and up on screen, here are all of the other specs in case you want to pause and take a closer look at any of this interface's offerings. As far as the headphone amp, if you want a super in-depth analysis, go check out Julian Krauss's coverage of this interface, but I was able to drive the HD650s, which are 300 ohms, to a more than reasonable listening level, and with the NTH100s, which are 32 ohms, I had no issues with it introducing any kind of hiss. So for my standard headphones, which range from 32 to 300 ohms, this amp performed more than reasonably, and I had no issues. Now in order to really test out the preamps of the 2i2 4th gen, I have the SM7B running directly into mic preamp 1, no fed head, no cloud lifter, my input gain is set at about 3 o'clock, and I'm peaking between minus 9 and minus 6 dB, so I have plenty of gain on tap. I'll go ahead and shut up so you can hear the noise floor at this gain setting. But I want to see how much gain we actually have on tap, so I'll go ahead and increase my gain all the way up to 100%. Speaking at a reasonable volume, at a distance of 2 to 3 inches away, I am able to peak around minus 1 dB. If I get excited at all, I can exceed 0 dBFS or hit 0 dBFS and clip and distort this microphone. So this thing has plenty of gain even for the SM7B without a fed head or a cloud lifter. Now I want to include a quick demo of the air circuit in the 2i2 4th gen. 
What you're hearing right now is the 7B without the air circuit engaged. Now I have engaged the first air circuit mode, which is called presence mode. This boosts about 4dB starting at 100 hertz, going all the way up to about 7 kilohertz, and then it's high shelved above that. Again, here is how the 7B sounds without the air circuit engaged. And now this is the presence mode. This is the first air circuit that's available. Again, here is a palate cleanser with the air circuit turned off. And now I have turned on the second air circuit, which they call presence and drive. This boosts below 300 hertz by about 2.5 dB. We get a 1.5 dB cut around 500 hertz. And then we get a 6 dB high shelf ranging from 1 kilohertz all the way up to about 10 kilohertz. So this has a much more exaggerated impact on the sound of the recording. Again, here is how the 7B sounds without the air circuit. And this is the presence and drive air circuit in engaged. Just for good measure, here is the presence air circuit, and now this is the presence and drive air circuit. Again, this is the presence air circuit, and now I am back on the presence and drive air circuit. Much brighter and a little bit scooped in the mids and a bit bassier as well. Of course, I have to include a comparison of the 2i2 3rd gen against the new 2i2 4th gen. So I have the 7B running through a mic splitter. On the 3rd gen, I have my gain set ever so slightly below 100%. On the 4th gen, I have my gain set at about 415, and I think that may be a bit hot, but I will be switching back and forth between them so you can hear if there is any kind of difference in tone in the neutral mode. Now I have the air circuit turned on on the third gen. We only have the one option there. And on the fourth gen, I have the air mode set to the presence boost only. I'll be switching back and forth between them so you can hear the difference in this mode. Let me go ahead and go to the second air mode here. Now I have the presence boost and drive engaged on the fourth gen. I'll switch back and forth a couple of times between the third gen and the fourth gen. Fourth gen so you can hear the difference in sound between the air mode circuits. And now I'm going to replace the microphone with a 150 ohm resistor so we can hear if there was any kind of difference in the noise floor between the 2i2 3rd gen and the 2i2 4th gen. Now I'm going to replace the microphone with a 150 ohm resistor and slowly increase the gain so we can hear what kind of noise is introduced by the preamps on this interface. Now I want to include a quick demonstration of how the 2i2 4th gen handles a line level input. So I have the 7B running through the Warm Audio WA73EQ. My gain is set at 65 decibels. I have a little bit of EQ going on. My output stage is set at 0 dB. And on my meters, I'm peaking around minus 12 to minus 4 dB. So it is a little bit hot, but I'm driving it constantly of a lot in the analog realm. I could roll back the preamp to plus 60 dB and now on my meters I'm peaking between minus 18 and minus 12 dB, a much more reasonable recording level. So it seems as though the 2i2 4th gen has no issue handling a line level signal really well. In order to demonstrate how the auto gain function works, I have a tone generator connected to input 2. You're not going to hear this because it would be incredibly annoying. It is set to output at minus 50 dBV. Once I hit auto gain, it is going to capture that input level for a couple of seconds so it knows how loud the sound source is going to be. It says perform like you're recording and once it is run down, it will say auto gain in progress, auto gain successful. 
and now it sets the gain appropriately. And the reason that I used a tone generator is I wanted that consistent level so we can see what it's actually shooting for. So because of this, we can see that it sets your gain so you're peaking around minus 18 dB, which I think is absolutely perfect for recording. So good job there. And now you know what it's setting your gain for. Now I want to demonstrate the clip safe feature, which I thought was going to be some kind of compression or limiting. I was way far off. All it does is turn down your gain if you hit 0 dBFS. I have turned on the clip safe button and I have also increased my gain. Go ahead and keep your eye on the gain for input 1. If I get a little bit closer, look at how it turns it down. Then as I move off the microphone, the gain does not turn back up. So it essentially just turns down your gain if you get too loud. It doesn't do any kind of compression, doesn't do any kind of limiting. It just turns down your gain if you get too loud. That's it. Now I'm going to demo the DI instrument inputs with an electric guitar, an electric bass, and an acoustic guitar with the raw signal, and then with an amp sim, and then in a full mix. I have to admit that every couple of years when Focusrite puts out the next generation of their Scarlet series of interfaces, it never seems to be a groundbreaking revolution, but it does seem to be an iterative update which offers some nice quality of life upgrades, and the fourth generation of the Scarlet is no different. And first up as far as pros is the amount of gain on this preamp. You have more than enough gain to drive the SM7B to the point of clipping. You also have great line level instrument and mic level inputs. The addition of the second air circuit gives you a bit more versatility, which I know a lot of people will appreciate. Also, all of the features on this device are controllable and accessible via the physical buttons on the interface, short of the direct monitor mixing. Also, it offers loopback functionality so you can capture your system-wide audio in your DAW. And the Control 2 software is such a massive upgrade over what was available for the third gen, where you only had the ability to turn on or off air and select if you wanted to input a line signal. This is a huge upgrade. 
But then as far as cons, I dislike the fact that you can't control phantom power for each channel separately. I also am not the biggest fan of the control on the interface where you have to select what channel you're adjusting and then you press the buttons. But I do understand it's somewhat of a necessity because on a device this small, there's not enough real estate to give each channel five of those buttons. I'm just not the biggest fan of that control system. And now we get to my wish list. I wish this had an on off button. I wish the mixing allowed you to create mixes for your headphones, the direct monitoring, as well as the studio monitors. And I also wish there was a way to quickly mute the studio monitors, maybe by pressing that button in case you don't want to hear sound out of the speakers. And to wrap up, would I recommend the Focusrite 2i2 4th Gen? Both yes and no. I want to start by saying that around this price point, there are so many insanely good interfaces. You have the SSL2, you have the Audient ID series, you have Focusrite's Vocaster 2 if you're a podcaster, Arteria Mini Fuse, Motu M2, Universal Audio Vault series. There are so many good interfaces, and it really comes down to what your specific use cases are and what feature sets you want. So if this is right for you comes down to the feature set. So let's start with a yes why I would recommend this thing. And first up is the usability. I find this incredibly easy to use and incredibly intuitive. I was able to get it up and running in just a couple of minutes. Also, the feature set isn't the most robust, but I think for the vast majority of people, it will fulfill your needs. And I also find the Scarlet series to be pretty high quality and fairly robust. I am still using an 18i 22nd gen, which is six or seven years old, and it's still working perfectly. So if you are looking for a new interface in this budget, if this meets your needs, if it has the feature set that you want, then I think this is a nice offering amongst all of the other incredible offerings around this price point. But then we get to why I wouldn't recommend this interface. And number one, if you have the last generation of the Scarlet series, you don't need to upgrade. The performance benefit, the new features aren't groundbreaking enough to justify spending another $200. Secondly, if you have another fully functioning audio interface, I don't think you should make a lateral move to this interface, unless of course those new features are necessary for your production. And lastly, if you don't care about the air circuit, if you don't care about about the auto gain function, and if you don't care about the clip safe function and you aren't going to use them, don't buy this interface, save your money, or invest in a different interface that has features that you do actually want. All right, that is it. Bye bye. Whoa, whoa, boop.